Good morning, and at this time, will sergeants please start their recordings? PC has started. Thank you. All recordings started. Thank you, and Sergeant Biondo. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council FY22 preliminary budget hearing for the Committee on Governmental Operations. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification purposes. Once again, all panelists, please turn on your video for verification purposes. And to minimize disruptions, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you'd like to submit testimony, please send via email to testimony at council .myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation, Chair Cabrera. We are ready to begin. Thank you so much. Let me gavel into this meeting. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the city's governmental operations committee hearing on fiscal 2022 preliminary budget. My name is Fernando Cabrera, chair of, the, of this committee. Today, we will hear testimony from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services and the law department regarding their fiscal 2021 and fiscal 2022 budgets. The agencies testifying today carry out many of the most important functions that keep the city running, including managing the city's vehicle fleet, defending us from lawsuits, among other important functions. As chair of the Committee on Government Operation, I want to ensure that the critical work these agencies do is as effective and as efficient as possible. In order to do so, I look forward to hearing more detail regarding the agency's budgets and whether or not this funding is being used in the best possible way. I would like to thank the committee staff, senior financial analyst Sebastian Bacci, committee counsel Christopher Murray, senior policy analyst Emily Forjohn and Elizabeth Cronk, as well as my own legislative and communications director, Claire McLevain, for the work on preparing for this hearing. In addition, I would like to acknowledge that we have been joined by council members, uh, Dharma Diaz, myself, Perkins, Rosenthal, and Yeager. Now I would like to welcome, he said, Camille, Commissioner of, of the Department of City, uh, Citywide Administrative Services to testify before this committee. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. Uh, DCAS fiscal 2022 preliminary budget totals $1.3 billion, including $223.6 million in personal services funding to support 2,546 full-time positions, $715.3 million or 51, 55.1 percent of DCAS overall budget is allocated to citywide heat, light, and power. This is the city's utility bill, which DCAS manages and pays for all other city agencies through its energy management division. Today, I look forward to discussing many aspects of DCAS operations, including the state of the city's electric vehicle fleet, a review of fiscal 2021 preliminary mayor's management report, and the, agents, the agency's work in response to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic, among other important topics. With that, I would like to please ask the committee council to administer the oath and swear in, in the testifying representatives. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I am CJ Murray, Counsel to the Committee on Governmental Operations. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify, so please listen for your name to be called. During the hearing, if a council member would like to ask a question of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to three minutes, which includes the time it takes the panelists to answer your questions. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, there will not be a second round of questioning outside of questions from the committee chair. All hearing participants may submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. 
to all representatives from DCAS who will be providing testimony or available for questions, please raise your right hand. I will read the oath once and call on each of you individually for response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Lizette Camilo. I do. Executive Deputy Commissioner Quinton Haynes. I do. Executive Deputy Commissioner Don Pinnock. I do. Chief of Staff Carmine Rivetti. I do. Director of Communications Nick Benson. Do we have Nick Benson on the Zoom? We'll move on. Deputy Commissioner for Administration, Shamika Overton. I do. Deputy Commissioner for Energy Management, Anthony Fiore. I do. Diversity and EEO Officer, Belinda French. I do. Deputy Commissioner for Fiscal and Business Management, Richard Thom. I do. Deputy Commissioner for Fleet Management, Keith Kerman. I do. Deputy Commissioner for Facility Management, Jerry Torres. I do. Deputy Commissioner for Human Capital, Barbara Dannenberg. I do. Deputy Commissioner for Information Technology, Nitin Patel. I do. Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer, Sylvia Montalban. I do. Deputy Commissioner for Citywide Procurement, Mercida Ebrick. I do. Legal Counsel, Sanford Cohen. Do we have Sanford Cohen on the call? I do. Great, thank you. Senior Real Estate Services Advisor, Beatrice Thuo. I do. And Assistant Commissioner for Real Estate Services, Spiro Antipas. I do. Thank you. Commissioner Camilo, you may be in your testimony. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chair Cabrera and members of the Committee on Governmental Operations. I'm Lisa Camilo, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Citywide Administrative Services, where we provide effective shared services to support the operations of city government. We approach our work with a commitment to three core values, equity, effectiveness, and sustainability. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the proposed DCAS budget for fiscal year 2022. Since I was here with you last year, the world has dramatically changed. The COVID-19 pandemic has presented city government with enormous challenges and DCAS has been there every step of the way. DCAS has played a role in procuring critical supplies and equipment for those on the front lines, keeping us safe, safely managing 56 public buildings, including the custodial and trade services provided by our staff, identifying locations for COVID testing and vaccination sites, setting citywide policy regarding leave, teleworking, time off of vaccines, blood and plasma donation, and directives regarding employees' use of face coverings, and so much more. I'm also extremely proud of the way our agency has successfully managed to sustain ordinary government operations under the most extraordinary circumstances. While our city has had to marshal resources to confront the pandemic, the wheels of government have continued to function. While fiscal year 2021 is still underway, during fiscal year 2020, DCAS increased the number of civil service exams opened for filing by 51%, going from 129 exams during FY19 to 195 exams during FY20. We expanded the use of a new real estate management database known as Archibus to better track and inventory the city's real estate assets. The system has helped us identify ways to utilize existing office space before pursuing private leasing. 
We surpassed for the third consecutive year, 100 miles per gallon fuel economy equivalent for light duty fleet vehicles purchased. We continued to organize and participate in job fairs and educational events about civil service, including virtual events that reached over 2000 employees between April and June alone. We expanded the city's vehicle charging infrastructure with over a thousand charging points of the ports available for fleet vehicles, <clears throat> excuse me, including new fast chargers that charge electric vehicles seven times faster than traditional chargers. We expanded the use of real-time metering for electricity usage in city buildings to over 500 locations to ensure more efficient energy management, both saving money and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And we provided critical information and training to agencies on maintaining occupational self, health and safety during the COVID-19 pandemic. And while I wish we could name every individual achievement, this just gives you a taste of our accomplishments during the fiscal year. Today, I'd like to focus on plans for the upcoming fiscal year. And to put our budget into perspective, it's important to understand that the majority of DCAS's expenses cover utility costs for city agencies. Out of our $1.3 billion budget, 715 million is budgeted for the heat, light, and power. These are fixed costs based on forecasted energy usage and utility rates. And the good news is that DCAS is working every day with agencies through multiple programs to reduce energy use. The second largest expense is the salaries of our over 2,500 employees. DCAS's work spans an array of different responsibilities, so we employ everyone from carpenters to procurement analysts to energy management professionals and everything in between. In addition to these expenses, DCAS is tasked with multiple duties in ensuring the life and safety of city employees and members of the public who use the public buildings we manage. This includes cleaning snow, performing maintenance, and custodial services. Our agency received expense funds in FY21 and 22 for life and safety initiatives to protect the New York City government staff and the public that visit our facilities. The funding includes facade projects for various buildings in our portfolio at $6.6 .6 million combined in FY21 and 22, the completion of installation of safety nets at PSAC 2 at $1.4 million in FY21, an installation of elevator door locking monitoring devices at 330 J Street at half a million dollars in FY21. DCAS also administers the non-public security reimbursement program. This program reimburses non-public schools that are deemed eligible for expenses associated with the use of unarmed contractual security guards. While we are making new investments, DCAS, like every city agency, has identified budget reduction initiatives as requested by OMB to help eliminate the historically large budget gaps caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. These initiatives include a $2.7 million reduction to our FY21 expenses for our conservation and efficiency leadership program, which is also known as the Excel program. This program provides funds to city agencies for energy efficiency projects, such as retrofit projects, operating and maintenance improvements for facilities and specialized training for building operators. A significant portion of this reduction can be directly attributed to the pandemic. Due to COVID-19, various agencies that received FY20 Excel funding encountered delays in work because they could not access buildings or facilities where work was being completed in the last quarter of FY20. These projects were subsequently rolled over to FY21, causing a reduction of newly awarded FY21 projects due to the affected agency's capacity to start new projects until the completion of the FY20 outstanding work. A $1.8 million reduction to our FY22 retro commissioning program, which provides funds to city agencies to implement projects that will bring existing building systems and equipment up to a state of good repair. The projected $1.8 million savings will be achieved by, renewing, by reviewing energy efficiency report findings and identifying projects that can be consolidated into larger capital projects. A $6.4 million reduction to our FY21 personnel services budget which is attributed to accrual savings caused by delays in hiring. In terms of generating revenue, the FY22 budget is $51.7 million, primarily due to three factors. One, a projected $33.7 million in private rentals of city-owned properties, DCAS's largest source of recurring revenue. Two, $7.9 million for the sale of surplus vehicles and other city-owned equipment. And three, $3.8 million from applicant, fee, applic, applicant filing fees for civil service exams. 
For our capital plan, the preliminary budget reflects an updated four-year plan of $2.4 billion from FY22 through FY25. This plan includes maintenance and enhancements to DCAS facilities, renovation of leased spaces, and continuing our energy conservation work. The preliminary budget for FY22 is $733 million and will allow us to complete three core initiatives. DCAS's capital construction program for city-owned offices and court buildings total $185.5 million in FY22. This includes the routine operations and maintenance of our buildings. The capital plan for FY22 includes $279 million for energy conservation and green energy projects. This includes light lighting retrofits, HVAC upgrades, steam distribution improvements, and a variety of clean energy projects. $7.5 million has been allocated in FY21 to continue the installation of 100 fast electric vehicle chargers. These chargers will speed up the charging process, which will reduce the amount of time fleet vehicles are out of commission. It has been an extraordinarily challenging year, but I am proud of the dedication of our employees in supporting the city's COVID response efforts and in sustaining government operations when it's needed the most. I want to thank the city council for the resources and support you have provided to DCAS, and I look forward to working with you to build upon our success this year. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Commissioner, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank you for all of your efforts, especially during the pandemic. I know you took on and your staff took on extra huge responsibilities. And I want to personally thank you for your level of efficiency and effectiveness in which you were able to carry on that level of work with very short time of preparation. So I, I salute uh, your team. Let me recognize uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Perkins and Kalos. Let me start with a few questions and then I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues and then I'll come back with some closing question. As you know, DCAS current fiscal year budget increased by 707.2 million when compared to its fiscal 2021 adopted budget. And this increase is primarily brought about by increases in federal funding, primarily from FEMA, to combat COVID-19 pandemic gripping, gripping the city. So two questions related to that. Can you provide the committee with an updated breakdown on how much you have spent or committed to spend to date from this pot of federal funding? And second, can you provide the committee with an updated itemized breakdown of the equipment your department has specifically purchase to combat COVID-19 pandemic today. So for example, ventilators, face masks, face shields, gowns, cleaning supplies, and the such. Sure, um, and first of all, I appreciate your kind words about acknowledging the, the really hard work that the team um, undertook throughout the crisis. Um, I, I too share that appreciation for everyone on my team that, that, that worked so hard during that time. It was awful. <laughs> yes. um, so, but to, your, to answer some of your questions regarding the, the federal funds, I'm going to have Rich Tom, uh, our, my deputy commissioner for fiscal uh, and budget management, jump in if I misstate anything. So uh, I, I want to flag uh, Rich to be uh, ready to jump in. So for um, FY20, our commitments related to the the OTPS commitments related to COVID uh, were $748 million in FY20, and in FY21, $310 million have been committed through, for the purchase of um, necessary equipment for the COVID response. Um, with regard to a, a breakdown of what we have uh, purchased, I can give you high level numbers, uh, you know, we can certainly offline drill down into any of the information that you would like to have additional information on. Um, and I just want to make sure that I have the, yes, okay. So for disposable masks, I just want to make sure that I am looking at the right, we have 
the following. And I'm going to ask uh, Mercida to drill down a little bit more on the medical side, but on the non-medical side, um, meaning for uh, for city workers, uh, we have uh, procured um, for disposable masks. We have uh, about 300 million masks. Uh, isolation gowns, level three, about 40 million. Uh, KN95s, about 35.5 million. And isolation gowns, level two, 12 million. N95 masks, about 51 million. Um, uh, hand sanitizer, 11.7 million. These are, I'm talking about items, uh, itemized yeah. um, the vol in terms of volume, not dollars. Um, isolation gowns, level one, about 8 million. Full service ventilators, uh, about 3,000, uh, and swab kits, uh, 9.3 million swab kits. We have corresponding total uh, delivered amount as well. We can certainly share this information you know, offline. If you have any other questions that you want to kind of drill down on, we're happy to provide that. And, and this is what you have spent already, disseminated already. Uh, can you break that down a little? The, everything that I just read off, we are, are ordered amounts. Ordered. So ordered. Um, these are in various levels of stockpiles. As you know, we, we purchased um, to secure a stockpile, both from the medical, from a medical uh, needs. So that includes the surgical masks, the N95s, and the ventilators. We have a 60-day um, stockpile ready for that. And for our return to office, you know, um, uh, employee safety and health, we also have a cache of uh, a supply on hand, uh, ready in our central storehouse for distribution. As you know, there are many thousands of, in fact, I think, I believe it's the majority of our city workforce has, in, has been showing up day to day uh, doing their work. And so we've been supplying agencies all throughout the year uh, and, and last year with um, protective personal equipment for, for those workers uh, as well. So we, we, we've been, we have both a stockpile and have distributed uh, to, to our agencies all throughout. Did have agencies indicated to you uh, when they're planning to go back to their offices so you could be ready uh, with the equipment that you need uh, to disseminate? So as the mayor announced, um, the, the administration is planning for a return to the office for those who have been able to work remotely um, for May. And you know, May, will, we will start to see um, uh, workers return to the office um, in, in, in that month. Uh, we're working on plans to make that, um, uh, to make that, to implement that plan um, but we have been, you know, in very close contact with all of our partners to make sure that we have enough equipment and sourcing to, to ensure that everybody has all of the PPE that they need to, to effectively do their work and safely. And as I said, we have that stockpile in our central storehouse with another, you know, uh, te everything teed up to continue to order more if needed. You know, as far as, uh, and thank you, Commissioner, as far as we can see, the DCAS fiscal 2022 preliminary budget has yet to include any funding related to the purchase of personal well, PPEs and other uh, sanitation products to deal with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Can you share with us how much funding do you anticipate will be included in the DCAS fiscal 2022 budget for this purpose? And when will these funds be including in fiscal 2022? Those are, those are discussions that are ongoing with OMB to determine what the needs are and what, the, if, what, the, what that amount will be. So I unfortunately don't have anything to share at this point, but we're working very closely with, with them to, to, to tease that out. So you'll have it, uh, I'm assuming, for the second budget in May. I hope to have more information to share. In, yes. In okay. Let me switch quickly to Rikers Island. As you know, the council passed local law 16 of 2021, which transfers the jurisdiction of portions of Rikers Islands that are not in active use as a jail site to DCAS beginning on July 1st, 2021, 
with the full transfer of Rikers to DCAS to be completed by August 31st, 2027. Meanwhile, local law 1721 requires a feasibility study to be conducted regarding the construction and renewable energy resources. So with that context, what resources we decast need in connection with the first partial transitional jurisdiction of 2021, of July 1st, 2021? What benchmark will ensure the successful and completed transfer of Rikers Island by 2027? Can you provide additional information as to the level of DCAS involves, involves involvement and this uh, feasibility study and do you know which agencies will be involved in this process? So um, we're, we're, you know, working on implementing all of the requirements that the bill lays out. Um, we are working with, you know, all of our, our, our partners that both that are named in the bill and in folks at City Hall and um, the Mayor's Office of Sustainability to work through those details. Um, so I, I don't have anything concrete and specific to point to and, and, and provide you with, but we are working on sketching that out. Um, you know, it's, but the, 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 the bill only recently um, was uh, enacted. So, you know, we're, we're definitely having, starting to have those discussions and sketch out what that's going to look like, not just for us, but for all of the agencies involved. But it's, a, it's definitely, it's a multi-party effort to, to make all of this happen. So we're engaging on all those fronts. Do you have at least a timeline for completion? of the feasibility study? I do not. Okay. Um, let me switch over to energy management. Let me recognize we've also been joined by Councilor, Council Member Powers. Uh, according to the preliminary mayor's management report, the number of cumulative, cumulative uh, installed solar capacity for fiscal 2021 has only increased by 0.17 megawatts since fiscal uh, 2018. Uh, this barely shows any growth over the fiscal year. Uh, what, why has the number of megawatts installed increased by such a little amount from fiscal 2018? Are there any projects in the pipeline that are currently installed due to COVID-19? If so, please provide an atomized list of projects with readjustment completion timeline and expect them megawatt, megawattage. So I'll, I'll start it off and then I'll kick it over to Deputy Commissioner Anthony Fiore to give you more details. But yes, we have def certainly encountered even prior to COVID um, some, some challenges with bringing on, um, uh, with, with the contractors that we had and, and to um, uh, execute, excuse me, some of these discussions that were negotiations with, with labor on a PLA, which I know Anthony will talk about that have been that have since been resolved. And certainly during COVID, there was um, a cause delays in terms of not being able to access certain buildings. First of all, construction had been paused and then having, um, you know, difficulties um, accessing those, um, those functions certainly caused a delay. Now, what I can report um, is that we have identified and have been um, uh, have, have started and then the pipeline, uh, a number of projects that are either started or about, you know, we'll, we'll start that we've identified as projects to start um, that we plan on certainly pursuing aggressively. Um, and in the megawattage associated with those in either in progress or in the pipeline, has, we've identified about 40 megawatts of, of power. So um, Anthony, I don't know if you wanna add additional details to that answer. So I wanna to toss to you um, to speak on, on this a little more granularly. Sure, thank you, Commissioner. And uh, good morning, Chair Cabrera and the rest of the panel. <clears throat> um, uh, we have since um, construction restart happened, it, installed an additional one megawatt of solar, <clears throat> and we expect another two megawatts to be installed uh, by the end of the first quarter of this year. So while there was a slowdown, um, which really was the result of negotiations with many different stakeholders on um, different 
ways to deliver solar energy projects. We, as the commissioner mentioned, we were able to secure a project labor agreement um, with, the, <clears throat> with the Building Construction Trade Council. Um, and we think that uh, is of great benefit. Um, we also uh, have added a number of members to our solar team in DEM. Um, <clears throat> and we have, as the commissioner mentioned, a growing pipeline of projects, uh, 175 different projects in the pipeline that will total 42 megawatts. And by the end of 2023, we uh, expect to have about 50 megawatts total installed. So will you reach uh, the 100 megawatts by 2025? <clears throat> we hope so. That I mean, that's certainly our intention. As I mentioned, we expect to have 50 megawatts installed by the end of 2023, and we're continuing continuing to identify the additional 50 megawatts that will be needed to reach that 100 megawatt goal by the end of 2025. Is that realistic within two years to find 50? Uh, I, I believe it's realistic to find it. it the question is execution <clears throat> of, of that. And obviously that depends on, on many, many things. But, um, you know, <clears throat> we, I believe, have made a transition in this program um, to where we can really ramp up um, uh, the installations. So, so the main issue, just to be clear, was was it an access or was it the labor agreement or both? Um, there were a couple things. One is uh, there were many stakeholders that want to see more solar projects um, delivered um, through uh, union labor. Um, and that's where we negotiated the PLA. The other side is where we deliver projects through um, power purchase agreements with, with private developers. <clears throat> there are issues with the private developers securing um, financing. Um, each project they finance individually, which would then require us to go back and um, amend our contract and resubmit to the comptroller um, because of the uh, financing partner uh, name change. So we've worked hard to try to address both um, challenges on the uh, capital project delivery side, as well as on the power purchase agreement side. Most of these, uh, these solar panels will take place in public schools? <laughs> the majority of um, projects are on schools. On schools. Great. I know my colleagues have uh, questions. I'll come back uh, with more questions uh, later on. So with that, uh, let me take it, uh, pass it on to the CJ. Thank you, Chair. I'll now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you'd like to ask a question and you've not yet raised your hand, please do so now. You'll have a total of three minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelists. Once I've called on you, please wait until the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your question. Uh, I'd now like to welcome council member Kalos. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Fernando Cabrera for your leadership and partnership. I know that uh, if it was up to you, we wouldn't be risking our lives right now petitioning. So I wanna thank you for trying and uh, People are getting coronavirus that shouldn't. Uh, if folks remember, I tend to ask all of my questions up front because I have a time limit on my questions, but you do not have a time limit on uh, answers. So please pencils out. I want to start with a thank you to the DCAS team, including uh, Deputy Commissioner for City Provide Procurement, Mercida Ibrick, for uh, welcoming me to the uh, warehouse um, and even giving me a chance to spy a little bit at Doris. Doris. Uh, so I, uh, first question is, if anyone is watching right now and they're working at a city agency that doesn't have PPE or is being asked to ration, approximately how much do we have in stock? Suffice to ask, uh, can the agency get them from you for free? For Commissioner Lissette Camillo, uh, how many duty restrictions are being considered and what are their addresses? Uh, for Executive Deputy Commissioner Don Pinnock, how many provisional employees do we currently have? How many have been hired? How many civil service exams and promotional exams are scheduled for the next few months? 
And to the one in five New Yorkers out there who may be facing unemployment, pay attention to this one because this is where you could get some great city jobs. Uh, for Deputy Commissioner Anthony Fiore, uh, for management, management, Local Law 97, the Climate Works for All legislation that we passed did not apply to city buildings, but how far are our buildings from applying? And last but not least, for Deputy Commissioner for Fleet, Keith Kerman, how far are we from achieving an all-electric fleet? And go. Uh, so I'll jump in on, on my question. Do modifications. Uh, we have a total of 19 that have been filed. 16 are active. Um, let me just, I just want to make sure that I'm reading this right. Give me one second. Um, and let's see, total of 19 entities have applied. We've got 13 requests that are active, six that are inactive. Uh, we can, they're, they're pretty much, we can share the, the addresses. We've already put in the notices uh, for the uh, various elected officials that have, um, that are, that are, um, that represent the areas that are, um, uh, that are being uh, requested to, to be removed. I don't know if you want me to read through them. 77, 777 Rutland Road, East Blastbush, 1932 Bedford Avenue, Crown Heights, 247 Bushwick Avenue, uh, I, I think it's 1392. Uh, there are 12 listed 13. on the open data set on your page, but you've got, um, you've got 16. So you've got four that are missing. Time expired. So yeah, uh, if you can read through the, because we all need to figure out which four are missing from your- Yeah, and we'll, and we'll update if necessary. So 247 Bushwick Avenue, 1277 Putnam Avenue, 149 Rockaway Avenue, 142 West 131st Street, 2432 Walton Avenue, 6601 Fleet Street, 2017 East 104th Street. Um, I'm not sure uh, what you're looking at. We might have, uh, uh, some that have, excuse me, some that are there that uh, have not submitted enough documents. There are four that uh, have not uh, submitted enough documents for initial review um, that have applied. Um, and, and so perhaps that's where the um, discrepancy lies. So if, like I said, we would have, be happy to share this with you and we'll make sure to update the website. So. I know you also asked how much we have in stock, uh, so, so PPEs in stock. Um, in terms of the numbers, I will turn that over to Mercita, but I will say, so if a an, if an city employee requires uh, PPE, um, agencies will, the process is that agencies will request what their needs are uh, to City Hall, uh, we get the overall need and we will disperse to agencies and deliver to agencies um, uh, depending on the need. Mercita, I don't know if you have updated information on how much we have, how many PPEs we have currently stockpiled in our warehouse and if you have that information, if you could share. Yeah, I can share some top line level uh, numbers. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you, council member, for actually visiting the storehouse. I know you had a great time uh, seeing all of the stock and seeing the work that we did. And I certainly our staff uh, appreciated, uh, you know, having uh, having you there and being able to sort of explain the work that we do uh, and and certainly the pride that we take in the work that we do. Um, so just some top line numbers uh, and also to reiterate the, the commissioner's comments. Uh, to our knowledge, all city agencies are, you know, have all the PPEs that they need uh, and that they've requested. Uh, that process is managed through uh, through each of the agencies, uh, you know, deputy mayors, uh, and then we get those requests uh, through the storehouse. Some of the top line numbers that we have physically at the storehouse available for distribution are, you know, around six million K and ninety five masks, three million cloth masks. Um, and we've got something like, uh, you know, over 300,000 uh, cleaning products available for, for agency uh, distribution. But it's a very long list and I can always share that offline as well. Uh, shifting to your human capital question, I'll kick it off and then turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Barbara Dannenberg. Um, so we continue to make progress on our provisional count. Uh, it's continuing in the right direction. Our current and most recent data shows that we have 13,873 provisionals uh, 
on, on, uh, in the city's uh, workforce, which compared to the beginning of uh, the, the previous plan or we started, uh, was, which was 23,296, we're definitely um, you know, headed in the right direction. Uh, with regard to our schedules uh, for exam, I'll, I'll turn it over to Barbara Dannenberg to speak a little bit about this, but as you can imagine, um, our, um, our issue with uh, social distancing and, 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 and our ability to provide in-person multiple choice exams have been stymied throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which so we've had, which means we have we had to close our CTAX, um, which has prevented us from administering um, the multiple choice tests um, uh, at on site. Uh, we have continued to provide um, non-multiple choice tests, so things like the QIE or education and experience exams, thankfully. Um, but in terms of schedule, I'll pass it on to Barbara Dannenberg to talk a little bit about that now. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, sorry, I have a pretty thick mask on. Um, uh, yes, we, uh, and good morning um, at Council. Um, yes, we have a pretty aggressive schedule that we are attempting to administer um, while taking advantage of our automated systems. Um, as the Commissioner just um, stated, our testing centers have been closed. Um, we uh, were only, only, only able to open them for a few short weeks back in the late fall. Um, so without those testing centers open, we cannot um, administer our multiple choice tests. However, um, we are looking to um, administer both to address the backlog of exams that we have not been able to administer and also to keep up with um, what needs to be given um, in order for the city to continue hiring uh, when we're able to do so. So we're looking at about 120 plus exams um, over the next few months to finish out the fiscal year. And those exams include our online education and experience and also our online qualifying um, incumbent exams or QIEs. Thank you, Barbara. And then shifting to uh, Aunt Deputy Commissioner Anthony Fiore regarding um, Council Member Kalos's Local Law 97 question. Anthony, you wanna take that? Sure, good morning, Council Member Kalos. Thank you for the question. Um, local Law 97 actually does apply to city buildings and it requires uh, city government to go further than the private sector. Um, we need to achieve a 40% reduction by 2025 and a 50% reduction by 2030. Um, whereas the bill for the private sector, if all the buildings comply, we would expect to get a 40% reduction by 2030. So city would be going 10% further than the private sector. Um, and as of the latest uh, emission inventory, the city government operations have achieved a 23% reduction in emissions as compared to 15% in the private sector. So I, I think it really illustrates that the investments the city are making are paying off and demonstrates the private sector that, that we can do this. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. And then uh, Deputy Commissioner Keith Kerman uh, regarding the question about uh, the electric fleet. Sure, okay, um, good morning. So we have about 2,800, a little bit more electric vehicles now and 1,020 electric charging stations, both the largest programs in New York State um, and growing. Um, we just announced we finished our first 65 of 100 fast chargers, but we will have by June and projects going really well and you should be seeing those fast chargers all over the city. We'll have 100 fast chargers and fast charging is really essential for this next phase of expansion. And then what we're doing now working with Mercedes Group is we are bidding contracts for a huge percentage of the fleet now, electric SUVs, electric pickups, electric vans, electric garbage trucks for the parks department. And we hope to have something exciting about that to share very soon. Electric class three and four trucks. Just those categories of contracts, all of which we'll bid in 2021, that would be over 10,000 fleet units that we would then begin transitioning in our more or less 10 year replacement cycle into electric units. And we've seen a really great move in the electric fleet industry. I could, we could not have bid an electric pickup or van um, contract and expected you know, viable results even two years ago. Um, so the plan, of course, is an all-electric fleet by 2040, 
but we will see a huge percentage of the fleet with electric vehicle contracts through DCAS procurement, really hopefully by the end of the year or early next year. So a lot of progress. And Thank I think you. that concludes all your questions, answers all your questions. Thank you so much for uh, those questions. And thank you, Councilman Michaelos. Uh, you actually covered some of the ones that I wanted to cover. So you helped me out there. And thank you uh, as the former chair of governmental operations. You, you really care about these issues uh, that we're talking about today. So thank you for being a champion. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, uh, I know uh, Keith, we have spoken about some previous probably about a year ago or so, uh, sanitation trucks. I believe back then the technology was not there. Is the technology there, uh, especially when it comes to um, the removal, or actually, yeah, removal of snow or, you know, can those truck handle the long hours, 12 hours uh, rotation? Yeah, so right now sanitation is testing. We have a Mac 25 yard all electric garbage truck and that's being tested now through their truck. They have a great sustainable truck lab over in Woodside, Queens. And so that, you know, this is the first model of an all electric garbage truck. Obviously this would be the most important project we could do. So much of our fuel and maintenance costs come from the sanitation 2200 garbage trucks. So they're in that testing phase now. And one of the biggest questions, of course, is, is plowing, is emergency operations. We also will be testing soon an all-electric sweeper. So sanitation is one of the largest, if not the largest users of street sweepers in the world. Um, I think someone once told me half the street sweepers in the United States are in New York. Um, so they're going to be testing an all-electric sweeper. And so you know they're going through, and they have, a, they have a great shop run by Spiro Catan, who's a supervisor of mechanics. And, and terrifically committed to this. So they're in that testing phase now. And so there will have the core two units, the sweeper and the garbage truck. They're gonna be testing them to make sure they can work, determine what changes or improvements would need to be made to the models. And hopefully that will begin the basis of the next stage, which we hope would be to bid out replacement contracts, you know, the long-term contract for replacement of vehicles. So that's where we are now. Are you in conversations with the Board of Education regarding school buses? You know, the kids are breathing all this combustion coming out of school buses. Um, and I'm sure if we could do it, we could have that Mac truck for sanitation. I'm sure there's school buses that could go electrical. Yeah, so we recently received the first two of three all electric school buses. Um, and they're interesting both in that they are the first all electric school buses in, in the this, city, this but they're the first school buses the city of New York has ever owned. And you know, the school bus program is a lease program, a contracted. So these are the first two. So we are working now. In fact, I think there's a, a draft in my inbox of an MOU to, to begin operations with them. And that would be the testing phase. And obviously there are over 10,600 school buses. So that would be a huge move but first, just like with sanitation, we need to make sure they work, they're reliable. We don't want to be running out of battery. You know, we don't want to be running out of energy while kids are in the middle of a roadway. Um, but we are in that. So we have our first two. We'll have three. I believe the third is supposed to arrive very soon. And then so we'll go into that testing phase. We'll partner with school bus operators to do that um, and then go from there. But, you know, tremendously exciting potential where we are now. We have the initial units. We have to make sure they work and figure out any operational maintenance charging issues with. Uh, really quickly, I, I, are these hybrid or the straight electric? They are straight electric. Sanitation and electric. The sanitation in the school buses I just described are all electric. There's no gas. There's no diesel. What would happen if we will have... If we have some years ago when electrical grid went down for for a substantial amount of time, what, what would happen at that point? Well, it's a great question. You know, one of the things that we will have to do, right? So if you have a power loss in the city, and obviously we've had that at different times after Sandy and other times the blackout, and currently the, the, the fleet isn't impacted. We have generators for the fueling sites, the liquid fueling sites. But obviously when you go to an all electric fleet, now if you had a power loss, 
you have different type of issues. So we've done a few things. Number one, 88 of the units, 87, and we're buying two more, sorry, 87, are those solar carports. And you know, we have one at the municipal building, we have them all over the city. Those are not tied to the grid. They are freestanding solar carports. So in a blackout, they would all have power, mm. right? So they, they're completely off the grid, they're not grid dependent. So one is the solar investment, we're buying two more as we speak and we're looking to expand that. Then there's no question that as we go into the big electrification projects, sanitation trucks, school busing, policing, um, fire department, you know, we're gonna have to have more, more substantial emergency backup power. Maybe that's diesel, you know, huge diesel generators for the buildings. Maybe there's a more sustainable backup power source, but we, we absolutely have in the radar screen that as we go further down this process, backup energy supply you know, at these major facilities is gonna to have to be part of the mix. Thank you so much. I have, Commissioner, just one last uh, set of questions related to commercial rents. Um, can you provide us information as to why uh, commercial rent miscellaneous revenue has been declining since uh, fiscal 2018? So I, I can certainly talk through the most recent decrease in commercial rents um, from 21 to 22. We had one particular lease that uh, under the terms of the lease went from rent payments to a uh, pilot. Um, that's the Grand Hyde Hotel. So that doesn't count as revenue. So you'll see a, a significant chunk because of that. Um, and I think that there have been some other, um, uh, some other larger um, leases that have also come offline either through either switching from um, either you know expiration, switching to pilot, or just change in the in the terms. Um, Beatrice, uh, are you? I think you're on. Um, or even Rich Tom, I don't know if you can speak to the the overarching decline since eighteen. Um, do we have information on that on that question? Well, I would say that uh, the Grand Hyatt is the uh, is the variable on that because the revenue on that is based on percentage of occupancy and all. So there has been varying varying amounts each year. It's not a fixed amount. Got it. Uh, and on twenty uh, the. A January 2021 oversight hearing, DCAS testified that 25 of its tenant had requested a rent payment extension. Has this number changed at all since January? And what's the total value of past rent due to the, uh, to the city? Um, I know that we have had some requests for uh, reduction, which we have certainly you know, engaged in discussions, but um, have, have negotiated um, an extension for time to pay for many of the ones that have we've uh, been requested. Um, so um, Beatrice or Rich, I'm not sure if we have any additional increases in those requests since January. We can certainly get back to you and, and give you specifics if they have. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't have them on hand, but if anyone does, please share. Sure. I, the number has basically stayed the same, but we, in terms of what amount, and as Commissioner said, it's more deferment of the rent, and then they'll pay the rent over around like a 12-month period. But the number has stayed the same in terms of the exact amount. We can get that number for you. Uh, we had Council Member Rosenthal, before she asked her question, this is my last one, so I don't have to come back uh, and ask some questions, is the graffiti problem uh in our public buildings it is chronic it's beyond chronic it's it's disheartening uh what can we do we gotta get some funds to clean it, it just making new york city a very unattractive place can we restore funding uh to get this graffiti of our public buildings well i mean i, I you know that's certainly something that uh you know we've We've, we've had in our portfolio, we only have, we only manage and directly, you know, and deal with 56 buildings, which we unfortunately, um, certainly during last summer's, um, uh, a lot, you know, civic or, you know, protests, there were a lot of, there was a lot of graffiti 
on, on our buildings, which took a, a lot of time and money from our team um, who did extraordinary work to, to clean them. And it definitely was a heavy lift. I can only speak to our portfolio. Right. Um, uh, so I can't speak to the broader city, um, city initiative and funding, but you know, I think that's something that um, I'm sure is being discussed with OMB. Um, I, yeah, so I can't speak to the broader city initiative, but uh, you know, we understand it's, it's incredibly, it, it took us a long time and a lot of elbow grease and a lot of um, work to, to remove that graffiti from our beautiful, you know, you know landmarked um, our buildings and, and, and the facilities team does a great job at, you know, addressing them immediately when it comes up and, you know, our, our capital construction uh, team when it's when it's a little too when it's not easily removed, having to you know bring in vendors to you know painstakingly restore some of these buildings. So it, it it's definitely you know a big a, a big ordeal. We understand. And thank you, thank you for getting on it right away uh, in terms of the fifty six buildings that that you do manage because it just make I it's one of my pet peeves. I can't stand uh, graffiti's in public property. I mean, people want to graffiti their own building, they own it. That's another thing. I love art, love it. I love it when it's done right, uh, but not in public buildings. Uh, let me pass it on to uh, Council Member Russell. So thank you for your patience. Thank you so much, Chair. Time starts Chair. now. Thank you so much, Chair Cabrera. You really hit um, all the main questions I wanted to ask. So one reason I wanted to get on was just to thank uh, Commissioner Camillo for all her work, um, especially during the pandemic. Uh, you know, thank goodness you, you're, you've been there because um, I know that you give really steady leadership. Um, I'm gonna ask a question that I know you're not gonna know the answer to, but I'm hoping you'll get back to me on it. There's a coalition group called Climate Change for All. And they have issued a report, um, a really terrific report that they issued in October 2020 that talks about creating 100,000 climate jobs. And um, they, uh, they have in, in that plan, an expectation of spending over a period of time. I think it's um, 180 million a year for five or 10 years. I, I, again, I'm not totally facile with the numbers, but have you tried to do a comparison and would you consider doing a comparison to their suggested strategic plan compared to what the city has laid out? Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for the kind words, uh, council member. Um, all praise is to the team. They did, um, I, I, you know, they, they truly did amazing work. Um, and I can talk for another two hours just on those efforts. <laughs> but, I, but I won't, because I know we're time limited. Um, regarding your question, I'm not familiar with this report. I don't know if Deputy, Deputy Commissioner Fiore has been. I, we're certainly, I'm certainly open to reviewing the report, seeing what they lay out and seeing if we can, um, you know, how, how the two plans compare. Yeah. Um, Anthony, do, are you familiar with the report by any chance? I'm, I'm not familiar with the report, I, but what I can tell you is that um, since fiscal year 14, um, the investments that we've made are estimated to um, produce or retain about 3,300 jobs. Um, and obviously there's a broader um, green jobs program that's happening um, across the city that, uh, you know, we are a, a portion of. So i um, happy to look into that, that report um, and Great. see if there's further that we can do. So thank you, uh, Councilman Rosenthal. Sure. And I'll ask the committee staff if it's okay with you, Chair Cabrera, to send that over. Um, and then secondly, and again, forgive um, my ignorance about expired. this. 
Chair, may I continue? This is the last question. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Um, we, I, rem I vaguely recall in the cobwebs of my brain having a hearing perhaps with sanitation, talking about implement, no, not the one with sanitation. It was with the DCAS committee back in my first term and um, talking about implementation of solar and how that was going to be laid out. And I, I don't quite remember what the criteria is for measurement every year, but at that point you were, you know, at a certain percentage um, and it was all um, PPAs. And I'm wondering where you are along that continuum for PPA and PLAs. And the chair may have asked that earlier, but yeah. I'm curious. I, I, so I remember that, uh, that discussion <laughs> and there were, it wasn't exclusively PPAs back then. We, we, de we definitely had some capital uh, solar projects that okay. had been delivered and have been working on. Um, and, and we did talk briefly about this and Anthony, you know, take it, you can take it and talk through what some of those details are. But over the past couple of years, we've actually been working with labor, with the BCTC on um, entering into a PLA specifically focused on solar. So, oh, so to address some of those labor concerns. Um, but Anthony, uh, you know, feel free to uh, fill in some of the, uh, the details. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we can get back to you with, you know, kind of the quantitative numbers of capital versus PPA projects. Um, we have such an aggressive goal as, as we spoke about back during your first term that, um, you know, we're, we really need to take advantage of every project delivery vehicle that we have available to us. Um, and as the commissioner mentioned, we worked long and hard uh, with labor to come up with a project labor agreement that would cover um, not only capital uh, projects, but also power purchase agreements. Mm -hmm. um, we established a pre-qualified list um, for solar developers that is subject to the project labor agreement. We've had difficulty with getting um, union uh, electrical contractors to um, respond to that solicitation. We spent a lot of time uh, doing outreach with, um, with the Electric Contractors Association group um, as well as local three, um, and and really highlighting that you know the 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 availability and opportunity to participate in our programs through the pre qualified list um, that was just uh, reissued, and unfortunately, some of the previous solar firms that were on there did not respond, um, and we've continued to do outreach with them. Uh, uh, to get them to, to participate. Uh, but we, we can get back to you on kind of completed projects, um, uh, PPAs versus capital work. Uh, That'd be as great. Well as my, can... my concern is just timing, you know, that you've, you've gotten so far over the last five years and then the expectation for the next five years is sort of much more. And um, yeah, that's what I'm curious about. Okay. as well as the PLAs. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank you, Commissioner, to your staff. Again, I want to echo what we've been saying all along from the very beginning and, uh, and with Councilman Rosenthal as well, uh, the great work that you guys have done during this time under pressure, unexpectedly, you were placed with a, you know, a tremendous responsibility and uh, you did a great job as always. So I salute you, I honor your team and uh, looking forward uh, to uh, working together uh, so we could uh, finish what we have started. Thank you so much, uh, Chair and, and Council Members. Uh, we really take that appreciation to heart um, and certainly on behalf of the team, um, you know, we, we thank you too for the support and of course, as always, you know, uh, we look forward to continuing that partnership. So thank you. Thank you. And now I would like to welcome Corporation Counsel James Johnson, the head of the law department to testify before this committee. Thank you for testifying before the committee today. The law department's fiscal 2022 preliminary budget totals 
240.9 million, including 165.9 million personal funding to support 1,788 full-time position, positions. Today, we look forward to discussing many aspects of the Lost Department operations, including its package of new needs in the preliminary financial plan and its miscellaneous re revenue, among other important topics. With that, I would like to please ask the committee council to administer the oath and swear in testifying representatives. Thank you, Chair. To all representatives from the law department who will be providing testimony are available for questions, please raise your right hand. I will read the oath once and then call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Corporation Council, James Johnson. I do. First Assistant Corporation Council, Georgia Pistana. I do. Managing Attorney, Ariel Good Trufant. I do. Chief of Administration, Kenneth Majerus. I do. Thank you. Corporation <laughs> Council Johnson, you may begin your testimony. Thank you and good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and distinguished members of the Government Operations Committee. It is a pleasure to come before you to discuss the Law Department's fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget. Um, as we've just seen during the swearing in, I'm joined by First Assistant Corporation Counsel Georgia Pistana, Managing Attorney Muriel Good Trufant, and Chief of Administration Ken Majeris. Between them, they have over 90 years of service to the city and the Law Department. I'm grateful to be testifying with them, but after this last year, I am grateful to have been able to serve with them. Um, every year, their wisdom has really been put to use um, in a year of extraordinary service. The city, obviously, as you all know, is vast with more than 8.6 million residents, more than 300,000 public servants, one of the nation's largest fleets of civilian vehicles and more public buildings than any other city in the country. The city has a broad array of civil and commercial legal matters and the law department is responsible for all of them to some degree. The department represents the city, um, the mayor, other elected officials, including the city council and city agencies in all affirmative and defensive civil litigation. As a prosecuting agency, the department represents the city in proceedings brought in family court, alleging violations of criminal law and in proceedings filed in criminal court to enforce the city's administrative code. Law department attorneys draft and review local and state legislation, real estate leases, procurement uh, contracts, which was particularly important during uh, the pandemic, uh, and financial instruments for the sale of municipal bonds. The department also provides legal counsel to city officials on a wide range of issues such as civil rights, on education, intellectual property, land use, and environmental policy. The department's work embraces all city entities and operations, and our impact has been and can be tremendous. In a typical year, the work reflects the talent and the work ethic of a phenomenal group of public servants but 2020 was no typical year. And as I will discuss below, the work reflects the very best in my view of public service, character, perseverance, and an all consuming commitment to duty. Um, as the chair mentioned, the department currently has on board 934 assistant corporation councils and 770 legal support professionals. Approximately 30% of our team is ethnically diverse and 59% are women. Indeed, the department's 16 legal divisions, of those 16, nine are led by a woman, which makes the department a leader in the legal profession and the beneficiary of a lot of recognized talent. The law department plays an important role in advocating for the common good protecting the rule of law and enhancing our city's fiscal strength. And I wanna run through a couple of examples of how we have either won the city money or have saved uh, city funds um, during the last year. Through the work of our affirmative litigation division, in this fiscal year already, we've already brought in $40 million into the city treasury 
when UPS paid after a bench trial and our victory on appeal, damages and penalties for the delivery of untaxed, unstamped cigarettes to customers in the city. This was the largest judgment in the Southern District of New York last year. Our team also brought suit against US, US Department of Energy, uh, rather Education Secretary, Betsy DeVos, and we obtained an order striking the rule that unlawfully diverted Federal CARES Act funds to private schools. In that case, we ensured that over $50 million went to the New York City Board of Education for economically disadvantaged students in K through 12 public schools and not to private schools. We recently added another $25 million payment into the city treasury in connection with the settlement of a false claims law act lawsuit that suit involved a hedge fund manager who failed to report state and city taxes on deferred fees. Further, consistent with past practice, we anticipate saving the city approximately $200 million in payments, payouts from the Judgment and Claims Fund through our continuing litigation to compel insurance companies to defend and indemnify the city. In these cases, we are enforcing coverage against lawsuits arising out of the work performed by private contractors and permittees. As a city, we should have little tolerance for insurance companies that repeatedly force us to expend vital city resources, time and money, just to get them to defend claims that they had previously agreed to cover. The law department is currently reviewing our options regarding these companies. We're successful in these cases, but they are cases that we believe we shouldn't have to bring. And we may come back to you with additional thoughts on how we can ensure that city contractors only sign policies with reliable insurers. A further example of our defense of the city FISC is in our commercial and real estate legal, uh, litigation division. This division defends the city in a wide range of contractual disputes. These disputes fall into three rough categories, will include three rough categories. Contracts with private companies to build or repair the city's infrastructure, leases of important public properties, and contracts for all types of goods and services. These claims are largely based upon negotiated terms of pre-existing agreements and typically involve significant exposure to the city. In the first six months of FY21 alone, the division resolved $175 million in claims for $25 million. Clearly, that's a savings of $150 million. Similarly, our tax and bankruptcy division's defense of real property tax assessment protected approximately $63 million in property tax receipts in fiscal year 20 and another $26 million during the first half of fiscal year 2021. It is vitally important that we protect the city treasury against filed claims. In our view, however, that's not enough. One of the most important assets any government has is the trust of its citizens. That can be hurt when, any agent, when an agent of the city injures a person, whether or not negligently or recklessly. Uh, accordingly, the law department works with other city agencies to identify and mitigate risks of harm. That causes savings of money, but also savings of trust. Our strategy turns on the work of our risk management unit. A risk management approach to local government asks not only how we can bring our costs down, but how to address conduct that may harm our citizens. At the law department, we have a risk unit that works with agencies across the city to identify city policies and practices which create risks and liabilities and to collaboratively take steps to control, reduce, and where possible, eliminate these risks. Identifying, assessing, and mitigating risk depends on the access to high quality information about municipal service, services and government operations. And given where we stand in the information flow, the law department is uniquely pl placed to lead these citywide efforts. One of the things that we've done is we formed an interagency steering committee or council to address citywide risks. Uh, to, together, our risk management efforts have, among other things, helped improve the information flow, um, helped us enhance our ability to solve problems uh, effectively together, 
uh, and it's assisted agencies with identifying and remediating risks. Uh, we don't yet have a sense of, of the total impact of these efforts, um, but we can see them in practical terms. Uh, and we know over time as we develop our metrics, we will get a better sense of the impact of these, this work and enhance our ability to do more going forward. One of the risks that we are concerned about is posed by the federal stimulus package that's, that's coming in. We believe that many of us are looking to do uh, in the city, will be looking to do quite good things and necessary things with it, but we also know that there are those who would be looking to profit for what they see, from what they see as a large quantity of money coming in. Uh, we view this as a strong risk, and we want to make it very clear that for anyone who wishes to defraud the city, the law department will not hesitate to pursue all legal avenues against them, including referrals to the appropriate district attorney. Last year forced us to respond to unprecedented burdens that afflicted the city. Corporation Council. Yes, sir. Give me like the shorter version, if you don't mind, only I because can... we only have a certain amount of time. And I know we had council members who would like to ask questions. Okay. Really appreciate that. I will shorten. Thank you. Um, Thank you so in the last year we were faced with, um, as, as all of us, we were faced with uh, the consequences of the pandemic. What that required us, us to do was, um, as you just heard from the DCAS commissioner, um, be quite nimble in response. Uh, we increased our coordination with um, all of the general counsels in the city. And rather than meeting periodically once or twice a year, we met once every week to solve the problems related to the turnaround. Um, related to both to, to the defense of the city in terms of providing public safety and public support to, to public health officials, uh, and to developing mechanisms for, um, for moving forward. We um, um, uh, and con have continued those efforts as we're thinking through how do we return uh, to work. Um, and then finally, uh, and then finally, um, what we have done with um, in the last year, um, rather what we're doing going forward is um, we are also focusing on um, the work of family court. Uh, we have more responsibilities in the, from, the, from family court as a result of raise the age, and we're pushing to think more creatively about how to um, serve both the needs of public safety, but make sure that the youth that become uh, justice involved um, have the support that they need to get their lives back on track. I uh, apologize for going over, over length. Oh, good. Uh, that was just a short, uh, really a short summary of all that's been done. And I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much, Corporation Council. And, and I know it's frustrating sitting on the other side because you're doing so much work and you like to share it, uh, but we'll definitely uh, have your testimony for the record. Uh, and so, uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, first thank you. Thank you for your stand and uh, not allowing people who would like to defraud the city or misrepresent themselves, uh, having uh, supposedly viable insurance when they don't. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being that firewall uh, that, that we so need uh, because we have seen, um, we have seen, you know, these lawsuits. It's, I've been in the council for 11 years and it seems like these numbers keep climbing. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, in the preliminary plan, miscellaneous revenue for fiscal 2021 spikes to 63.6 million with an increase of 42 million since budget adoption. Uh, can you share with us why uh, this miscellaneous revenue spike uh, by this large amount in fiscal 2021? Is this uh, related to revenue originating from case settlement? And if so, can you provide which cases are related to? One of the major cases that this, they, they are related to either wins in court or case settlement. And the significant um, amount is largely attributable to the UPS win that I discussed in my opening statement. Okay, great. Uh, of the number of ECB judgment referred to the law department for collection, roughly what percentage are deemed uncollectible because the summons, although, although 
uh, facially valid, including a defect, such as an incorrect name. Uh, how much money does this represent? Would it, the use of electronic summonses devices by issuing agencies mitigate this issue? Well, we only um, collect uh, approximately, I think, uh, about 1.9 million uh, last year. Um, I don't have a precise number of, um, of what can be, um, uh, what's uncollectible or hasn't been collected, and we can come back to you on that. Okay. Um, my sense, though, is that anything we can do that expedite the, the summoning, summonsing process, including making it electronic, um, is something that would, at the end of the day, probably help us in recovery. Do you use the collection agency to assist in the collecting ECB uh, debt? Uh, yes, we use um, we use outside agencies, outside law firms to help us um, to collect the debt, um, and that enables us to um, put that those debt into that activity into one bucket and help us deal with what is a very large workload in many of the other um, the other areas. Have you thought of having you know the other day I wrote a uh, an article, as a matter of fact, it was uh, su supported by Cranes, uh, New York, regarding having an amnesty uh, where the penalties are waived and they only pay 75%. Last time we had an amnesty for the entire city. I know this doesn't apply to everything related uh, to uh, your purview, uh, but we were able to collect $160 million dollars because uh, it feels like there's, it's reachable, right? Like a reachable goal. Have you thought about um, that approach? It isn't an approach that I've, that I've kicked around with staff, uh, with our team uh, recently, but it's worthwhile. One thing that I would be, um, and we have to make an, an evaluation. Um, we definitely need the, the funds to come in, uh, particularly now. Um, and um, it is even relevant to the issue of, of restarting the economy in terms of the, so it's not only a question of bringing the funds in, but also some of the other policy concerns that we would want to balance. Um, and it's worth, definitely worth considering. Uh, in terms of when collecting, and, and, and you're on point there, uh, we, we got to connect those dots. Uh, when collecting ECB debt, does the law department seek to determine whether the debt debtor is a vendor that's doing business with the city? Um, I am not as close in on that issue as some of my colleagues may be, and perhaps um, uh, Georgia or Muriel might, uh, might be able to provide some insight on that. I'm not familiar with it. We get ECB debt after they've been through the hearing process and the judgment is entered. So by the once we get it, it's been through a pretty lengthy process. But we can look up and see who, if anyone does the check on whether or not they're a vendor for the city. Maybe we could have a system in place this way. We don't have somebody who uh, keeps doing business with the city, has tremendous contracts, and some of them making millions of dollars, and yet they're not paying their debt. This might be a way to assure that uh, we get what is due to the city. Uh, let me move on to units of appropriation. As you know, the council has repeatedly called on the administration to create additional units of appropriation for the law department budget uh, to reflect the numerous uh, division, including, as I mentioned before, over 1,700 staff that make up the department. Our job in the council is to increase transparency of the law department, 240 million uh, budget, and hold the government accountable to its spending. Would you agree to include additional units of appropriation to better reflect the nature of your department? And is there a barrier as to now why not create these additional units of appropriation? Chair, thanks for that question. It's and it's. I think it's an important one, and I know that it's been. It's a perennial question, um, and one of the things that we have to do is actually strike balance. We are fairly detailed in the information that we pro provide, but one of the challenges is um, we are also not only would we be disclosing information to city council, but we were, would be disclosing imp certain information to um, parties that are opposed to us. 
who might get a sense of our case strategies based on how we are um, uh, deciding to put resources into cases, particularly on affirmative litigation and what we're trying to do. So having some flexibility um, within the current construct to uh, provide the information um, to counsel, but not be completely transparent about how we're making choices that reflect our litigation strategy, I think is, a, is, a, is, an, uh, is the balance that we've been trying to, to do, um, all the while mindful of the, the debt we all owe to the public to be accountable for the way funds are spent. But this uh, is the sort of thing that enables us to actually get more judgments like the $40 million judgment we got in, in UPS. Indeed, and we don't want to put you in a vulnerable position uh, where uh, it shows where you could uh, be target. Uh, uh, I would imagine there might be some categories uh, mm -hmm. that we could work on and we can have a meeting on the mind. So looking forward to that level of conversation. Yes, uh, I, think, I think you're right. And we will definitely engage in that conversation with you. Thank you so much. And I, I want to uh, pass it on now to Council Member Rosenthal uh, for questions. And then I'll come back with just one set of questions. Time starts now. Thank you so much, Chair Cabrera. Um, it's so good to see you, Director Johnson. I'm so glad you're here. I mean, you're going to hear it in my summary comment how much I'm glad you're here. But I have three questions. Chair Cabrera, would you rather that I ask the three and wait for the answer? Or should I go through each one? Uh, whatever you prefer. Oh, you're very kind. Um, okay, let's get started. Um, so thank you for your great work over such a short period of time. You've been here for like a minute. And I can tell you're already bringing some accountability and accountability measurements and criteria, all the stuff that I love. Um, first question is, do you settle the NYCHA construction contracts? Have we so, been involved in settlements of them? Yeah, in other words, like I, I maybe it's just my bad luck, but in my district, there are oftentimes um, contracts where the workers don't do what's expected. They have to cancel that contract and move on to the next contract. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you work on those cases. Most often not directly, but Georgia, there may be some comes, cases that we take on. Is that correct? I think she needs to unmute. Um, no, we do not work on NYCHA construction okay. cases. NYCHA is an entity right. created by state law and has its own legal department and its own judgment and claim. So it, we do not work at all on any of those cases. So. Okay. Have you, you know, one thing you might want to consider is having like peer mentorship where maybe, you know, you could have mm -hmm. meetings together and, you know, share good best practices on things, just an there, idea. Yeah, there's a new general count, no, not so new anymore, and they hired a managing attorney who's a former uh, person from the law department nice. who we have a good relationship with. So nice. those conversations have started and are on good. Good, good, good. Secondly, um, does your office collect data on how much police bad behavior costs the city? And I'm confident that there's um, there are different tiers of police bad behavior and different technical words for it. So, you know, cut me some slack here. But I'm just thinking, like for the Garner family, I think the city settled for six million ish dollars. Um, and I'm just asking, do and I don't even need to know the total number. But do you collect that number, that annual number? Time. Expired. So we, we collect number. Uh, we collect the data on uh, cases where we represent the police department. Yeah. And sometimes police employees. Um, so, for instance, last year the um, total amount paid out to JNC was more than 166 million dollars. Mm -hmm. The last uh, five years, the payout was over a billion dollars cumulatively. 
Mm -hmm. And thank you. Um, uh, can I just ask what is the controller's role in that? Do they just cut the check or do they have a bigger role? Well, depending on the nature of the claim, um, sometimes the controller may settle out the claims even before they, it gets to litigation. Um, in other instances, mm -hmm. in other instances, um, um, there is uh, at least some dialogue between this department, the law department, and the controller, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, the controller has to sign off. Okay, I sure Muriel to learn. wanted anything to add. Yeah, I'd love to learn more about it, but not on this Zoom. Did you say a billion over the past five years? Yes. Okay, great. Last question. You were talking about risk management, mm -hmm. and it sounded like um, it sounded like the you were um, finding criteria by which to measure your success. You were saying that you know, and and pretty soon we'll be able to really you know, identify how, how much money that, that this mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. yields. Can I just ask, was that an idea that you brought and so you just started instituting it or has that always been there? Um, the issue of risk management has been in the department for some time, probably yes, yes. since um, um, Michael Cardozo was <laughs> the corporation counsel. What I've done in the last year is I think elevate the profile and done what I can to encourage interagency cooperation um, on these issues. Uh, and so we have we provided um, uh, more focus throughout the department on this, but this mm -hmm. is an initiative that's been within the department for some Right, time. right. Uh, you had just m mentioned at the end there that in a few years you'd be able to measure the success. And I was wondering hmm, why in a few years, why not now? <laughs> Well, we are at, uh, we may, I don't want to overpromise and under deliver, I'd rather, sure, sure. Uh, and these things take some time, uh, but we have a number of uh, interagency uh, groups that are Got focusing it. on first collecting Got the it. data, and sure, then sure. we'll be able to see what the results are. Great. Last example, can you just give one example of um, something that that group identified and that you either got an agency to implement or um, are working with an agency to to implement in order, you know, to prevent these things from happening again. Well, one of the things we're thinking through is where you can get data from DEP and data from transit uh, and put them together and look at them to see whether or not you can start to predict where potholes will come. Uh, ah. It's not yet there. <laughs> But that's an important thing for us to do because yeah. not only it's, would it enable you to predict potholes, but also um, transit data and the and the and the potholes may give you an early warning system for um, water main <laughs> breaks. So that's the sort of thing thinking that we're in the middle of right now. Wait a minute. So you're saying all those times I hit a pothole and that I could actually sue the city. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah, no, don't, not at don't all. Do that. What I want to what I want to do is get to the point where you're not hitting hot, hot, That's hot, right. That's, that's right. Thank you for that. And thank you, Chair Cabrera, for the extended time. Thank you, uh, Council Member. Uh, for just point of clarity, I if there's a pothole and I get a flat <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to get more people to to put a request, but I just want point of clarity here. Point, uh, point of clarity, I, I represent the city council. We represent the city council on some things, but not in pothole litigation against there the There you go, indeed. Uh, I, I, and I just want uh, more clarification. Uh, just remind me here, you mentioned that last year we paid out $150 million uh, with lawsuits related to the NYPD. Was that correct? In, in, in FY20, um, it was $166 million in either settlements or judgments. Are those, are those due to large cases or you have many smaller cases? There are, um, in terms of dollar amounts, it's more of a collection of, it's not one huge case, but, but uh, a significant number of cases. I mean, do you happen to know how many cases? I'm, I'm just off the top of my head. I don't, money. but um, um, I think that a member of the, the, my team might have uh, the number off the top of the head. 
It is a hundred, I'm sorry, 1,522 cases. So, wow. So the average payout is, is over a hundred thousand. If you were to break it down, a hundred and something thousand. That's a substantial amount of cases. Is there anything that we could do working with the NYPD uh, practices that uh, Corporation Council could give advice to NYPD uh, to better prepare ourselves and not being sued so many times? Well, we, we routinely give uh, advice to the NYPD in a, in a variety of ways. And one of the things that's being developed right now, uh, and you've seen, uh, and I know that um, uh, the mayor and his team at City Hall are working with the council on this, is the, um, the police reform packages. And some of the issues raised in, in the uh, proposals would address uh, some of these. Because at the end of the day, um, these are questions about sort of safety and use of force and things like that. It, out of those uh, recommendations, uh, which ones would help us the most? Hmm. The most is hard to say because they're interconnected. There are recommendations that, that relate to supervision. Um, and um, I spent some time in a different part of my life overseeing large uh, numbers of law enforcement when I was at the US Treasury Department. And supervision is a very important factor, uh, but also community relations and the various proposals related to the community relations. So when you take the, all of the proposals together, what you see is, a, is um, a set of recommendations that have both a procedural shift to them and a culture shift to them. And I think that the, the city as a whole and citizens in particular will benefit from that. And we'll see those numbers go down. Thank you so much for that. I just have one uh, main topic and that's new needs mm -hmm. uh, package. The fiscal 2022 preliminary plan includes 18 million in new needs for case specific needs in fiscal 2021. Can you provide an atomized breakdown of this total? What are the specific cases that this funding is going to? Uh, and do you anticipate that you will need additional resources in the executive financial plan for these specific cases? And if so, can you provide the committee with an estimate? You know, we're very much committing to continuing our work with OMB through these, these numbers. Um, and that work is ongoing and we'll, we'll see how it shakes out at the end of the day. Um, as you know, all of us, all agencies are really faced with uh, some big challenges um, on our needs, but we're working through that process with OMB. Um, Muro may want to address this a little bit further, our managing attorney, uh, but I think that's, that's the, our status right now. It's still fluid. The 18 million is for certain case specific needs. Uh, a long <laughs> portion is for the NYCHA monitorship also included are funds for Galeno, Floyd, Falcon, and Nunez, which are cases in which there are large litigations that may also have monitorships. Okay, thank you so much. Well, I believe uh, I'm going to ask our council, do we have any other council members that have questions? No other hands raised at this time, sure. So I believe uh, that uh, we have uh, come to an end. Uh, Director Johnson, thank you. Uh, thank you. You do an amazing work. Uh, and I want to thank your staff uh, for, again, being that firewall. Uh, we, we, we spent a lot of money in these litigations that take place in the city, a substantial amount. And uh, we got to protect the city from frivolous well, a previous one and those that are due should be due uh, indeed. And so we got to strike that balance. But I thank you again, very informative and looking forward uh, to seeing you again at the executive uh, hearing. And so, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. And with that, we conclude uh, today's hearing. I want to thank the staff, our staff, our dream team staff, they always do a fabulous, fabulous job. Uh, they make my job so much easier. And so with that, I want to wish everyone a fantastic day. Thank you, Councilman Rosenthal. You stuck to the very end. I always uh, 
like to praise those who do. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Day. Take care. Bye-bye.